a brand new cherry and white jersey, but it's not for a player. Rather, it's for Temple Basketball's new head coach, the 19th of program history, Adam Fisher. The new hire signals the end of the Aaron McKee era and marks the beginning of the Adam Fisher era. We'll hear from the new head coach on his plans for the struggling program. We've also got the latest on the Lax teams matchup against Cincinnati. Let's see if they can avoid a four game skid. I'm Patty Heckard, live from Edward Olson Hall. The fall football season is a long ways away, but fans will get a sneak peek at what the team looks like this fall. I'll, later on, I'll preview the cherry and white game. Our sports update is live and it starts right now. The Cherry and White Spring game is right around the corner for Temple football. Hello and welcome to Owl Sports Update. I'm AJ Patel. He's Jesse Demich LeVay. Yes, a football introduction on Saturday, but we had a different kind of an introduction on Wednesday with a new men's basketball coach. Owl Sports Update's Jake Gable was at the meet and greet on North Broad, and he joins us now at the studio set. Hey, Jake. Thanks, Jesse. It's been a few weeks since Aaron McKee stepped down as head coach and six players entered the transfer portal. But Temple has its man. Athletic Director Arthur Johnson believes new head coach Adam Fisher will steer this ship in the right direction. First impressions are everything. And for the first time since being named the new head coach of Temple men's basketball a week ago, Adam Fisher stepped on stage and made his first public impression in front of the Temple community at his introductory press conference. Welcome Adam Fisher to Temple. First, it's truly an honor to be here. Growing up in Bucks County to become the head coach at Temple is like a dream come true. Fisher takes over for Aaron McKee, who stepped down shortly after the Owls were eliminated from the AAC tournament in March. McKee spent four seasons as head coach and will step into an advisory role while Coach Fisher takes over. Despite not playing college basketball, Coach Fisher has done nearly everything else at the college level. He started off as a graduate manager at the University of Villanova and worked his way up as a video coordinator, director of operations, and assistant coach at Boston University, Miami, and Penn State. I am certain after visiting with him and understanding his background and feeling his passion and his energy, that all of those roles have prepared him to lead us back to the tournament. His recruiting ability was at the top of Fisher's resume as a head coaching candidate. During his time at Miami, he helped recruit four eventual NBA draft picks, most notably Reading PA native Lonnie Walker, who Temple was unable to convince to stay close to home. As much as I want to recruit this city hard, we're a national brand. We need to take advantage of that. We need to recruit nationally. This is an unbelievable academic place. We need everybody to know that. Moving to a third new home in three years, Coach Fisher had a message to his wife at the introduction. Settle in, because they're going to be here for a, while, for a while. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Jake Gable. Gentlemen, back to you. Thanks, Jake. Fisher has a good rep in the coaching community for recruiting high-profile hoopers in areas close to Temple. The Lakers' Lonnie Walker and former four-star recruit Isaiah Wong are from the tri-state area. But they made the trek all the way down to Miami to play for Coach Fisher. Down in the 215, Fisher also landed a pair of five stars in Bruce Brown and Dewan Hernandez. Both later got drafted by NBA squads. When Fisher was coaching at Penn State, he managed to ink five-star Jalen Pickett along with Andrew Funk who averaged over 34 minutes a game this past season. The recruiting doesn't stop with the players, however. Fisher has already filled out his assistant coaching staff. The lone returner is Chris Clark, who played at Temple and was an assistant under Fran Dunphy and Aaron McKee. The newcomers are Michael Huger and Bobby Jordan. Huger spent the last eight seasons as the head coach at Bowling Green. Jordan was most recently an assistant at the University of Albany. A native of Philadelphia, Jordan also played at Drexel and eventually became an assistant for the Dragons. 
On the other side of campus, there's also another relatively new coach who knows what Fisher is going through. Now in year two, football head coach Stan Drayton already has one of his recruiting classes on campus. And we will see this class for the first time this spring on Saturday in the Cherry and White game. Live at Edberg Olson Hall, Al Sports Update's Patty Hecker joins us. Hi, Patty. Thanks, guys. The spring schedule kicked off for Temple football on February 28th with the first of 14 practices for the team. Over the past few weeks, the team has been gearing up for the 2023 season. It all caps off their schedule with their first live scrimmage of the year in front of fans. Just one practice and one scrimmage to go. The cherry and white game is here, which wraps up the spring season for the Temple football team. Um, that's just another opportunity for everybody to go out there, uh, play hard, play fast, get better. The annual game will be held at Edberg Olsen Hall this Saturday. A big event for Temple Athletics, but to Coach Drayton, it's one part of the bigger picture. Not any more important than every day we're out there practicing, to be quite honest with you. For Coach Drayton and the starting roster, the cherry and white game is business as usual for them. But for some players, it means an opportunity on the field that's not guaranteed during the fall. You know, every day is an evaluation and every practice is a, a precious moment for us to get better. You know, so the spring game would be an extension of that. Linebacker DJ Woodbury does not take playing football for granted. The sophomore arrived in 2020 and started his time at Temple on the scout team. But he worked his way up and this past fall, he made his first start against Navy and recorded a career high 11 tackles. Every time that we get a chance to go out there, one is a blessing, first of all. And I feel like we just get a chance to show what, what we're capable of. So every time I get to go on the field and show my talents, I feel like it's, it means everything. The Owls have shown their dedication and mentality towards improvement during their spring schedule. This Saturday, in front of fans for the first time this spring, everyone will get a preview of what the fall might look like. Thanks, Patty. This will be a huge showcase event, not only for Stan Drayton and the entire team, but especially the wide receiver room. Patty, like, Temple is losing two of its top three receivers from last year with Jose Barbon and Adonis Cassandra's graduating. How are they going to really adjust and compensate for those losses? Mathis. Dewan Mathis made the transition from QB to, run, to wide receiver last season, and his experience reading coverage would be really helpful in his new position. With two open spots at wide receiver, Mathis has the opportunity to lock down a starting spot in his first full season at the position. Last week, Coach Drayton labeled Dewan Mathis as the most improved player in the wide receiver room. Here's a few, here's a little more from the head coach. We got some guys really growing up. You know, uh, Dewan Mathis is a guy that I think is, is probably the most improved in that room. Uh, just starting to really get uh, a clear understanding of what's being asked for him, how to go about his business, um, starting to use his speed on the field, use his size to his advantage. So those things are really good. Uh, yeah, without a doubt. Um, honestly, just knowing the coverages, stuff like that, seeing the DBs leverage, um, learning like how they want to play um, and the different reasons why they do the different things that they do. But uh, for the most part, just seeing coverage, like now I can be out there, I can see the ball. The anticipation comes to an end this Saturday. Gates open at 2 p.m. with kickoff underway at 3. Admission is free, but you may want to show up early as there's limited bleacher seating available. This is not your traditional football game. It's going to look more like a glorified football practice. In last year's matchup, for example, the defense earned points by causing turnovers and stops. Reporting from Edward Olson Hall, I'm Patty Heckard. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Patty. Time to take a break. Coming up, Temple Lacrosse tied its season record of 18 turnovers when it took on Cincinnati. And the men's soccer team was able to make inroads offensively, but were unable to eke out the win against Bucknell. We'll be back in 90 seconds. Women's lacrosse on the road Saturday, taking on the Cincinnati Bearcats at Nyford Stadium, trying to bounce back from a three-game skid. Very early in the first, Ava Goyer going coast to coast, ripping down the sideline and outfoxing the Owl defense to give the Bearcats the early lead. The Owls, though, not going away quietly. A little give and go here between Julie Schickling and Bellmaster Pietro before finding Amelia Wright, who cuts the lead down to two. 
But that is as close as this one gets for Temple. The PA native Lindsay Dakota gives Cincinnati the definitive edge as the Bearcats take down the Owls 12-9, dishing Temple its fourth straight loss. Temple women's lacrosse team is well known and well established. But our school does also have a men's team at the club level, and it's making history. Al Sports Update's Cam Murray joins us at the studio set to tell us more. Hey, Cam. Thanks, guys. The Temple men's club lacrosse team had the opportunity to travel all the way to Dallas this season. The Owls jumped off the plane with the chip off their shoulder and came home with the program's first ever win against a ranked team. Come on! Yeah! Get there! The Temple men's lacrosse club team was founded in 1980. Go! But in its 43-year history of the program, they had never beaten a nationally ranked club team until this season. I asked all the guys what their goals were for the season. That was one of them. Um, you know, get a ranked win, get our first ranked win. It happened about 1,500 miles from home. A 12-8 win in Dallas against SMU, who came in ranked 23rd in the country. It, it was a dogfight. We knew there was going to be a challenge, but I mean, we took it quarter by quarter, and we didn't realize the, the magnitude of the win until after the fact, and we realized that, oh, wait, this is Temple's first ranked win. In 2020, the team joined the Men's Collegiate Lacrosse Association, which is recognized as the premier club league in the nation. So higher competition, more travel, and more chances to beat ranked teams. There's a definite level of competition that's pretty high. Jumbo, jumbo. And I just want to get us, you know, kind of on the map and get us as far, um, you know, out there as we can, just to show people, you know, Temple has a men's lacrosse team, um, and you know we're. You know, we're pretty good too. Traveling to farther states and competing against better opponents has always been the main goal of this program. Beating number 23 in the country, SMU in Texas, however, does not distract the team from their main goal of the season. Get, get into our conference playoffs. So that's been our goal. That was our goal last year. We, we fell short. Um, and that's our goal this year is just, you know, get in the playoffs. The Owls are currently five and five, needing wins in all of their last three games in order to make their goal a reality. That's right, three must-win games remain for the Owls to keep the playoff dream alive, including two matches against division rivals James Madison and Pittsburgh, and a final game against East Carolina. The Owls need wins in all three games in order to make it to the postseason. The test for the team happens to also be their last home game of the season, this Saturday against the Dukes of James Madison. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Cam Murray. Guys, back to you on the desk. Thanks, Cam. Temple Soccer had a busy weekend hosting Bucknell. The kid from Canada, Xavier Rimpel, gets a one-on-one -on -one with the goalie inside the penalty box. As you can see, emotions are flowing early as the Owls are off to a hot start. Rimpel again hits the Hezzy and catches Sullivan on his heels. Two defenders couldn't do the job for the Bison, and the X gets thrown up again. Bison now, or Buckland now on the attack, gets the ball moving towards the right corner of the penalty box and gets it past the diving Temple Netminer. In the same position, Mario Valentic creates a little deja vu, tying up the game. This one ends in a draw, 2 2. Our GPA of our student athletes is, you know, a three, over a 3 0 consistently each semester. Student, athlete, not athlete, student. On the other side of the break, we look at how these student athletes balance academics and practice. Al Sports Update will be back in 90 seconds. It may be spring, but Temple Field Hockey was back in action at the City 5 tournament at Howarth Field. Owls getting off to a rocky start here against the St. Joe's Hawks with Lee James scoring the lone goal in this one. Second game of the day against Villanova wasn't much better for the Owls. Raina Smallage who threads the needle to Megan Mitchell who finds the back of the cage. Last opportunity here for the Owls. Tess Muller bullying her way down the field to create some space but misses the goal to, as the Owls fall to the Wildcats. One to nothing and finish one and three on the afternoon. Team will now take the bus ride to Easton PA to face on Lafayette on Friday. While these athletes are on the road a lot during the semester, the word student in the term student athlete comes first for a reason. Al Sports Update's Tatiana Harris is at the studio set with a look at the resources available to Temple athletes. Hi, Tatiana. Thanks, AJ. As student athletes travel and play games throughout the country during the school year, it is important to acknowledge just how much they are balancing. Putting in anywhere from 20 to 40 hours a week alone on athletics, student athletes are constantly working to stay ahead of the game. 
Being a student athlete isn't all about the wins, the losses, all of the attention, and a wardrobe of free swag. Most of their work comes when no one is watching. It involves balancing practice schedules along with being a full-time student. This comes with lots of time management, preparation, and plenty of support from the school. It's all about like, not necessarily sacrificing, but juggling everything that you have to get done. Um, in the free time, there's no free time. <laughs> so there, that's just a major sacrifice in itself. During the season, student athletes can have games and travel nationally up to three times a week. While they're taking long bus rides and catching flights, they must regiment their off time very wisely to accommodate their studies and other extracurriculars. One of the resources student athletes have at their disposal is the Resnick Center. The Resnick Center is a great place for student athletes to meet with tutors, advisors, and complete their work on their own time. And I usually just use Resnick as a study place too if I don't want to be home. And while some students thrive in game and in the classroom, our GPA of our student athletes is, you know, a three over a three oh consistently. Others can still sometimes fall behind and need even more support. If they're overwhelmed, um, which happens, right, we might have a student work with an academic coach, which is an additional layer of uh, the academic advisor, and they have study skills that they will work with the students on. You want to see Busy? Here is Busy. McKenna wakes up at 5 a.m. three days a week for ROTC training. She has classes four days a week, practice four days a week, and that doesn't include the days when she has to lift. Most days don't end until 7 p.m. Even on the weekends, she's playing on Saturday, studying on Sunday. Sunday is really the only day she can sleep in if she wants to. This semester, McKenna has 18 credit hours and eight hours of personal study. Keep in mind, this is the off-season schedule. Last semester, McKenna was taking 22 credits during game season. Much like McKenna, I am out of time for this segment. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Tatiana Harris. Back to you guys on desk. Thanks, Tatiana. In addition to the academic resources athletes have at their fingertips, there are also ethnic organizations that support athletes as well. Our Sports Update's China Dunneman has the story on Temple's new Black Student Athlete Association. <laughs> It's not a place you usually find Temple student athletes on a Sunday during the school year. And like, it's very important to have a space for black student athletes to come together. That's why this trip to Washington, D.C. is so important. At the White House and at the African American Heritage Museum. It's a day trip for Temple's new Black Student Athlete Association, or BSAA. It was co-founded by football's Wisdom Korshi, lacrosse's Carissa Cross, and soccer's Samaya Togba. It's important that we have a platform where we can depend on each other. BSAA is in its second year and already has 34 members. Many are underclassmen who are stepping up and taking charge. I think we'll just, we're going to be the roots of this organization. I think we can change it all together. BSAA makes sure their athletes can connect more outside of a meeting setting. So they take trips and connect with other groups, such as last week in Washington, D.C. After the museum, they met with the Grassroots Health Foundation to talk about how college athletes can coach students towards a healthier future. This trip may be the first, but it won't be the last. I could see more trips, you know, beyond D.C. Maybe there's even room for some sort of international trip at some point. Um, BSAA's future is only looking brighter with support from other black organizations at Temple. Reporting from McGonagall Hall, I'm China Dunman, Owl Sports Update. Top organizations and now top place. Justin Jay's top place to be exact. We've got the top three as always coming your way this week. That's right. At number three, starting things off, the lacrosse team is the headliner yet again. Bellmaster Pietro, she leads the team in points, but she also leads the team in assists. You'd think she'd pass it off right here, but she takes it all the way to the house herself. This is thanks to Cameron Zavacki, number five. She darts across the middle of the field, leaves the lone defender on her heels in no man's land, wondering, do I cover my assignment or the person with the ball? sets up an easy goal. At number two, the Owls' win streak may have come to an end, but Maran Delmas' magic here, kick serve into the backhand of his opponent, rips it down the line, 
right into the Delmas wheelhouse right here. Let's take another look at it. What a thing of beauty when Delmas heats up there on the backhand wing. That's right. The number one Xavier Rempel saw it once, and now you'll see it again. He puts on a handling clinic, making one but two defenders miss. Take another look. He forces the defender to the left, takes the inside, and makes Jordan Miller miss. That'll do it for our week's top three plays. When we come back, we've got a club team that's nationals bound. I sat down with a club tennis team that is off to Arizona for a historic first. Stick around. The members of the club tennis team did not expect to end up in Surprise Arizona for Nationals. Members like Caitlin Lee and Chris Chu exceeded their own expectations with this change to play among the top 64 teams in the country. This marks a historic first for the team. The Temple Club tennis team did something for the first time in program history. Qualify for Nationals which is underway and runs through Saturday. Yeah, one of the most exciting nights of my life. On a brisk October night, the Owls took down Carnegie Mellon in a rematch of the previous year's sectional quarterfinals, this time resulting in an Owls victory. Everybody was on the edge of their seats. We were all freezing our fingers off. Club tennis is distinct in that the men and women play on a combined team. We have really high energy when we play, and it's just something really unique to the sport. Temple did lose to Penn in the sectional semifinals in the final mixed doubles match. However, the Owls bid was already secure as the final four teams qualify for nationals. Not having it limited to like bo just boys or just girls you know, makes the whole experience a lot more fun. The team returned to the court in February following a three-month hiatus due to winter and no indoor facility. Everyone comes back rusty, so it's, <laughs> it's, a, great, it's a great feeling to start get, getting warm again. There is not only the match prep, but also the financial logistics. Club dues run $70 per year per player. However, a trip to Arizona runs a high tab leaving the players to scrounge for the difference. We've had to do funding, like Tripoli fundraisers. The Owls have realistic expectations in a field of 64, but they still expect a trip of a lifetime that includes the pure friendship of it all, veterans and newcomers alike. We hang out apart from the club to help us be a better team on court. High expectations moving forward for club tennis, especially for a club fueled by its bonds and determination. The tournament lasts for six rounds over three days in the Arizona heat. We have a special broadcast coming up on Tuesday. With the football season ending on Saturday, we take a time to recap the spring season and look ahead to the fall sports. Our Sports Update's Emily Cochran joins us with a preview. Yeah, thanks guys. On Tuesday, Luke Millet and I will go back to our highly anticipated football coverage. We sat down with head coach Stan Drayton and QB1 EJ Warner to discuss this upcoming season. Coach Drayton touched on the new hires working underneath him, both offensive and defensive adjustments, and the maturity of EJ Warner under center. For EJ, it was all about the team. He talked about the atmosphere in the locker room, his bond with the wide receivers, and how he's grown to lead this offense as one of the youngest players on the team. Now, our coverage goes so much farther beyond that it's called inside the nest special cherry and white game we'll have our expanded interviews but for now that's all i have aj and back to you guys on the desk the competition is heating up just like the springtime weather we are experiencing on behalf of owl sports update he's aj patel i'm jesse much stay safe and enjoy the action <laughs>